two driving hard, and I'm not looking at the correct camera. <laughs> I'm Mark Griffiths, and that is Ollie Williams. Hello, Ollie! <laughs> Hi, Mark. I'm now realising that because I've got a laptop camera which is right by the keyboard for some weird reason, and you're mm. over the top of my keyboard, that I'm going to get really confused, and people are going to be watching my chin if they watch the video version of this. I feel but like a red button option for chin cam would be quite good. A red button for chin. So we have an early entry in the name for this episode. <laughs> Thank you very much. How is life treating you this summer? Football withdrawal or too much football? Too, too much football, football. Yeah, if I'm being totally know. honest. Um, or, sort of. Because, because there's so much going on at the club off the, the field, field there's, it's, it's almost a case of, yes, too much football, but none of it's to do with actual football. Because, but it is so exciting at the minute. The Euros have been great as well, of course. Um, and when I've had a chance to watch, that's been brilliant. But uh, I think everything in terms of Wrexham, everything's very, very exciting at the minute. And I'm, I can't believe that the players are back in the next few weeks. Yeah, I had that realisation this week and yeah. panicked at where time's gone. Yeah, it's bad. When are they back? Uh, early July. Oh, man. That's, that's, that's like a week's time, isn't it? Football? Yeah, a couple of weeks. Couple, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, madness. Well, after this, we'll see how much we can wiggle out of it in terms of weird stuff going on. <laughs> and maybe on weird stuff, which is cool. John Pondicelli, and you're listening to the Dragon Art Radio Show. And we are back since we last spoke to you. We were evacuated the race course after a fire alarm, which turned out to not be in the race course. When I say evacuated, we both ran. So there you are. I wouldn't say ran. We didn't run. We, we, had the we alarm briskly for a while, walked. We walked out. Yeah, when we realised we should probably get out of it. Yeah. But we're all correct. safe and the ground is fine. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, let's talk about that ground because uh, it's quite exciting what's going on around it. Quite it's exciting, isn't it? Quite. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so I was thinking this earlier because I was looking out to the ground. I was thinking to myself, right, yeah, it's going to look really good. It's going to look different. It's going to be great. And I thought, it doesn't look necessarily so different to me because I've been lucky enough to be here this season. But I thought, if you've not been here for over 18 months and you come back in, say, when does the season start? Late August. Late August yeah. So, you know, all being well, we've got fans back in and you come to the race course and you see the work when it's finished, it's going to be different. It's going to be really different. I mean, not just the boards, but some of the other work that's going on at the minute. Pitch being relayed. I know it's been, um, yeah, it, we'll have really good good surface hopefully and, and a few little different bits of, of infrastructure within the stands and stuff like that that's, that's going on that I'm sure people have read that, that you know Humphrey's been putting out and we've been trying to keep you up, people updated with that on on social and on the website which has been really great so I think it's going to be really exciting I, I'm really looking forward to seeing it getting done I'm really enjoying actually just watching it being built you can see things happening you know that it, it's going to be very, very exciting. So, yeah, I think a few people are going to be pleasantly surprised when they enter into the ground. Those little details make a difference, don't they? You know, I mean, just the little small, tiny bits. Um, I always remember going to Forest Green when they got themselves a bit rebranded and had the fluorescent green kit and just looking. Mm. Just the fact that every piece of literature or advertising on the walls has that colour scheme and that branding it immediately made it feel, oh, it's, it's good here, it's impressive. This is a street, even though it's only a very minor thing. Um, and so it's just the fact that we'll have a ground that doesn't have, you know, sort of derelict signs behind the cops saying you can go in for two quid <laughs> and, and, you know, and we screw it over the top of the wall. Yeah. Just that in itself uh, makes a big difference in the environment, doesn't it? Yeah, and we know that the cop stuff's going to be really exciting. Um, you know, that, that's going to be long term. Um, and I really can't wait to see what that's going to look like. and. You know, I've not seen any of the the, the mock-ups of, of anything that's been done. I've not seen any of the plans, but I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what's going to happen with that. Um, and yeah, it's like branding and stuff like that. You, you're absolutely right. We want to get consistency all through the club. So, you know, it, it's going to give it that sort of that little bit extra. The things you don't maybe think about, but it, it's just going to improve just the look and feel of the place. Um, yeah, it, it's it's really, really exciting. I was writing um, a column on the end of this week, plug, um, talking about how uh, you know people think, oh, you learn from like an American way of doing sports, but we have a stupid cliche thing like Sky 
started showing football, oh, we're going to do it in more of an American style. That was cheerleaders and fireworks, which is mm. peripheral nonsense. Um, but the real lesson to learn is about sort of improving fan experience, which in American sports do extremely well when you're in the stadium. And so that, those sorts of alterations, those little things that improve your day at the ground, are actually the sort of lessons that, that British football can learn from, from American yeah. sports, and we have the, the fast track to do exactly that sort of thing. Yeah, I think fundamentally you've got to remember that going to a, to a game is... To some people, it's going to a match and it's the tradition. It's my what my dad did. It's what my dad's dad did, etc. And we we go there on a Saturday as is, you know, tradition. And a lot of other people, it is purely it is the day for you. It's it's the experience. And so the better the experience, the the more people you're going to get coming back through those turnstiles, which is, you know, it makes sense. And you're right in terms of you know American sports. You can go to a game in in the NFL. You can go to a game in the um, uh, MLB, anything like that, NBA, whatever. You don't have to be into the sport, but you enjoy the day. The amount of people I know who've come to America and said, yeah, I just went for the day, it was amazing. It's like, that's what you want. You want people who are going to really enjoy um, just everything around it. Um, some of us, we go, go to an away game, and the 90 minutes of football gets in the way of a good day. So, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, the, it, it's all about that. It's all about having that, that little bit extra. And I think at the moment, yeah, it, it's, the foundations are being put in place, I think, and it, it, it looks really, really great. One of the way games in the National League I remember most fond of is going down to Eastbourne. We okay. lost 4-3. <laughs> in fact, I can also remember again, we lost late on, but I still love the days to Eastbourne. I don't know why, probably because I'm... Well, I can say this now because I couldn't say it at the time. One of my favourite games I did last season was away at Wilson, and we lost four three. Yeah, yeah. Purely because new ground, it was nice, um, and the people were brilliant. Yeah. And I've never left a ground with a smile on my face after losing four three. But I did that day because it was just a great day, and I, I enjoyed that. It's a shame I couldn't fully experience it. Okay, the result wasn't great, but it was one of those things. So often, like I say, the games you remember, you often don't remember really the result or you don't perhaps be as affected. It doesn't ruin your day, the result, because you had such a, a good you know, time when you were there. Facilities are big. The people who are around the club are also really important in terms of that experience as well. So for me, you know, getting that balance and... and that infrastructure that's, that's being put in place and I think infrastructure is probably going to be the key word for, for what's happening going forward and yeah it's, it's, it's fantastic and like I say yeah a 4-3 loss at Wilston not great but yeah I, I can sort of say now if I'd have said this a year ago or whatever it was I'd have probably got pelted on that yeah it probably was but <laughs> yeah. well, to be fair that was the day when you realised that Clearly, Adi Yusuf is going to be that 30 goal a season strike that we've been hankering for. So, it is that. Yeah. Hey, yeah, to be fair to Adi, he got what, six goals in 19 yeah, 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 Did have a good strike rate, yeah. 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 I don't want to be fair to people. It's about social media. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, speaking of American sports, Philadelphia. Yeah. What about it? Going there. Are we? Yes. That's a rumour. Wow. No, that, that's, that, again, that's part of it. I mean, how new is that to us? We've, uh, the club's definitely not been to the States, has it? Cause, I mean, you, as our club, extraordinaire of everything that's ever happened here, you, you'd be able to, I'm sure, confirm that. Yeah. yeah no. I was talking to the club behind you. No. Uh, no, I, I think it's the first time we've gone to the States. I think it, that, that's absolutely fantastic. and. You know, everything around the day is going to be brilliant. You know, the, the local causes that they're, they're going to be supporting. Um, the stadium looks amazing. Philadelphia as a city looks amazing. It's brilliant. Obviously, the only downside, we can't have people, people there. But there is, you know, on the flip side, the amount of US-based Wrexham supporters who are going to get to watch their team play for the first time in how many years? That, that's really great for them. Um, and it makes us you know, accessible to an entirely new audience. So, yeah, it, it, that's, it was a weird one when that email dropped the other day. Um, but 
yeah, writing up on the website next fixture. So obviously, you know, the, the only fixture we've got going ahead is, is that one. So the front, of the pa front page of the website, it's got one all draw to Dagenham, followed by next game, Philadelphia Union away. So, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I think we're all looking forward to that, aren't we? I think even whether or not we're going or not, I think we're all looking forward to it. I'm sure there'll be a way for us to watch it and we'll find out those details for, for people and, and make sure that they're able to keep up with the game. But... Yeah, I think it's just the fact that I think we're all quite proud that Wrexham's going to be out there representing yeah. the town, you know, in a in a major US city. The, um, the only links I can think of of Wrexham and the US, although I think there'll be more that are just not coming to mind. Of course, uh, one of our ex players was the, the commissioner of MLS, Jay Edwards. <coughs> yep. And I, I suppose he is, I have to get him on. I've had phone game up and interviewed him before, I'll get him on again to, yeah, yeah. to chat to him. And of course, I'll go into detail, but I'm now thinking this could be a, a race for stories thing for me to type up for next week. Um, was Ed McElmenny, nearly McElmenny, no. um, captain of the US team when they beat America yeah. in the 1950 World Cup. 50? 50, yeah. Um, so that's a bizarre story where he basically was, wasn't good enough to make it here. Then did that. Then got to play a sign for Man United. And, it immediately became clear that you know, it wasn't quite good enough for X and it's a bit of a fluky thing that happened. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's um, really good. And and I tell you what, there is one player at Wrexham currently with a tie to them. To Not like he's US. Uh, to Philadelphia, to the Philadelphia Union. I'm not saying why because we're going to put uh, something out about oh, it okay. next week. But uh, there is uh, a really cool story that we're going to put up um, next week. I'm making it sound amazing as if he founded the club. <laughs> Did Aurelian and Carla have a child while he was over here? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just someone. There, we have got a Wrexham player who has played against them. Ah, oh, right. Oh, I may. Okay. Sure, you keep storm you. Uh, yeah, so we'll put that out next week and we'll talk about it. Um, but that's that's you know that that was quite interesting um, when we saw that. It's like of all teams in the MLS as well to to have played against, and that, that's pretty cool. You're very much playing the cream of the MLS. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I thought you were just sort of like bigging up our uh, our co-chairman in his home city. No, 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 I've got no but that, that was that was in fact. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> 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 um, and speaking of changing the subjects in a, 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 the most spectacular and an awkward way possible, um, Henri Car and Leader this week uh, saying that they're hoping that in the next week or so the search for a manager will conclude it, it's a um it's a watertight process i've been saying this week on week out, in week out there's virtually nothing at all coming out of this process at all and, and all the names coming up are speculation yeah yeah uh, <laughs> I, I have no idea who it is mm -hmm. and normally this has been what three weeks mm -hmm. there's always someone out there and there's always a name that gets plucked, and normally that name is fairly reliable because I think previously there was no smoke without fire. There isn't any smoke at the minute. That, that's the way it is. The, these names will not be revealed until I think that email drops in myself and Colin's inbox and we begin to arrange a press conference. I think that's the way this is going to go. Um, yeah. Like Humphrey said, he's hoping it'll be in the next sort of week or so. Um, I, I would trust that personally. I, I I think they've done again from the outside and not knowing what exactly the process they're going through at the moment. I would expect that they've gone through in terms of their due diligence thoroughly, uh, and I would rather see us take three or four weeks to appoint a manager and get it right than jump in after a week and go, that big name's available. Mm, exactly. And, yeah, I, it just makes sense. Be be methodical. Yeah. You know, go get the right person. We've already got players here, which I think is one thing to consider, the fact that they've given deals to players, um, which has been led by Les Reed and, and that team. Uh, so they know perhaps the type of people they've got at the club and they perhaps know the type of football they want to play next season. So that also then will come into consideration. So you're looking at someone and going, right, okay, well, we want to play this way, this sort of 
this sort of shape, but we want to be flexible with it and we want to get attacking this way. These are sort of the patterns of play that we think that these players can, can come up with and then you get the coach who can suit it because there's such a big process now in terms of bringing players in that we've seen and the fact that there are people above the manager who are also involved in that process. You perhaps, like I said, I, I, I believe that we, we'd benefit from probably having a head coach. So I think a lot of clubs are going that way at the moment and having someone who's purely on the training ground and talks to you about recruitment and things like that, and that's fantastic. Um, but whatever happens, I think it'll be the right decision. And I I'm, I'm really am the, the cliche of, you know, trust the process. That's where I'm at with this. I, I'm, I'm more than happy for, to, to take their time and get it right and for me to have to wait on that email. So I, I understand that on an emotional level why people are impatient. I mm -hmm. do get that. And I think in normal circumstances, I would possibly get edgy because we wouldn't be the big fish. We'll, we'd be a moderate-sized fish. And when you see signings being made by other teams in the conference, you think, oh, could we have gone for it? But we're not in that position now. And I think it's 100% right. I think it's right to wait and make sure we make the correct long-term decision on someone you think can take us out of this division and then take us further rather than just rush into something. The whole thing about big names and the percent really on that. Um, and also, you know, like you say, we, we will be able to track in, attract interesting players in beyond what we would have been able to attract before because of the new ownership. Mm. And we are, not in, we are not in the same transfer market as we would have been otherwise. I think that's key. That, the, the transfer economy is absolutely yeah. key, I think, with this. There are League One and Two players who are leaving clubs at the end of their contract because they just simply can't be renewed yeah. at this point. We're very lucky in the sense that we are able to almost go forward as, as you would expect, as usual, whilst other clubs are cutting costs considerably. So there are players out there. It's, it's, not, a, you know, it's, it's not a buyer's market at the moment. So in terms of player recruitment, I don't think we're going to go 15 new players and, and try and you know, storm the layer. I think we've got a really good spot spine of players here. Yeah. Well, yeah. The technical players, you're talking about like the, the identity of a team and the identity of a manager to fit into that. You can see we've, got, we've already got a very technical set mm. of players. I mean, the players that we've retained, and I think that suggests a certain approach to football as well. There's a, there's a logic going through all this. Yeah, yeah I, I, absolutely. Um, we've got players in, in key positions who, you know, I don't think it's going to be a case of, well, we've kept players and they'll just be, you know, warm in the bench. No, I think we're going to see players you know, that we have had last season involved and then we're going to improve around them. Um, the player I'm really excited to see, the one I'm most excited to see is Devontae Redman. You're smiling because you knew I was going to say that. I'm really excited to see how Devontae gets on. He came in the other day to sign his contract and was really, you know, really pleased, really, you know, happy to be staying and he really sees this as being a fresh chance for him. Um, and, you know, I couldn't agree more. It's a key part of his career. There's absolutely no reason that he can't play behind the centre forward or just off the side to him and, and, and score 10 plus goals for his next season. That's a challenge for me mm. in that I want him to have a good pre-season when he stays set and can then hit the season running. I yep. think he's got massive potential and with better creative players around him. He's got a competition surely, he's surely going to run up for some good strikers. But I, I just, I'm excited at the thought of Arsene finally getting that proper run out of season for us and showing what he can do. And green. Because mm. if you look at him and you think, oh, why is he playing in the National League? Yeah. I, I also think that in a different, in a different scenario, he'd have gone somewhere else. Not, not, not questioning his loyalty, just the fact that surely football league teams will have noticed him in the short time he's been with us and thought, he's got the, he's still got the makeup of a mm. football league player. You know, in a different market, they take a punt on him. Yeah, I've, I've watched his cross back for Ponticelli's goal so many times. Um, touch on Ponticelli, actually. I mean, he's been plagued by an injury that's just hampered his season. That, you know, it's, it's so unfortunate for him. The work I know that he's put in, in terms of sort of rehabbing those injuries and making sure he's 100% when he comes back, has been amazing from what I've seen. Um, you know, they're, they're certainly a dedicated bunch of lads. I know Kwame Thomas is doing a lot of work at the moment as well. Um, and, you know, just, just doing what they can to make sure they're not only back, but they're 100% and that they're, they're fit and fire and ready to go for the long term as well, which is brilliant. 
Uh, I agree with you on Ponticelli. The goal he scored goals at the end of the season yes, he, he when he got that, that run, yeah. and we always said this this season. Yeah, okay. Once he gets that run, he will score goals. Yeah. He scored two in five in his loan spell, mm. didn't he? I think it was two in five. I'll get those spreadsheet. You get that spreadsheet up, my friend. <laughs> Pretty sure it was. I reckon two and four. That's my guess, but it's a guess. And then it should have been three because he had a goal chalked off, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this season he scored. Must have been. Did he score a total of something like three or four goals come the end of the season? He scored against Weymouth, scored against Dagenham. Four. He scored four goals this 11 season. Eleven starts. Yeah. This is no competitions. Eleven starts, sixteen sub, four goals. Yeah. So and yeah, they all came late in the season, didn't they? Not bad for a player who's yeah. been played with injuries all season and come off the bench for the most part. And the season before, he scored two goals in four starts and one sub. Yeah. Years. And just looked really sharp, didn't he? he looked so good in that. Yeah, he did. And he's looked sharper as the season's yeah, gone on. Exactly. I said yeah. this to him yeah. about May time. I said, you look fitter, you look trimmer, you look like the player perhaps from last yeah. season. Because when you're injured, it, it's yeah. so difficult. Yeah. I just said to him, you know, you, you look at it, I said, you, I don't know if you feel sharp. He said, yeah. yeah. And I um, said after Notts County, because he came off the bench in Notts County, he said, we will start and score at the weekend. He went, yeah, no, well. <laughs> and he did. Yeah, that's what I need. Yeah. That's what we want, that's what yeah. want from your striker. Yes, I will yeah. start this game, and yes, I will score. So I think he's, he's a confident player when he's got that run of games. Going when he came forward. back from the injury he got at Notts County, mm. that was when it felt like it was the start of the season almost. <laughs> yeah. like he was now back and yeah. actually looking sharp at himself. And it's not his fault that he wasn't before. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited about him. Yeah, cool. And I'm really excited uh, about us uh, spying on Bappe. I think that's going to go well. Do you think he'll fit the system, though? Oh, back up. Yeah, he's, going be, he's going to be that you know, impact off the bench, isn't he? Steve, yeah. the, very much the French Steve Bodger. Yeah. Well, obviously, Paul Rutherford's moved on, so we need someone who got to come on and, and do a lot oh, of well, running, say, harassing people for that. that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 I mean, we've got to be careful, obviously, post Brexit. You know, we've got to make sure we can actually get, get, get the players in. Probably get them put next door soon, I hope so. Yeah. Have they made enough international appearances? Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, let's move on from that then, shall we? And after this. We'll have a little chat about whatever that says. Wales, I think. Wales, I, think. <laughs> I was only kidding. Honestly, I didn't know what I was doing there. I'm Kerry Evans, and you're listening to Dragon Heart Radio Show. And you're back in the room. Right, hello everybody. That's such a niche reference, Mark. <laughs> That's, That's, the sound That's so niche. <laughs> I don't want to go in the box. You've got to go in the box. I've got a very Phoenix night. Um, Wales, Wales played Italy in a football match. They did. And it was a weird match, but it was good. I thought. Yeah, it's probably our best loss. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what you'd say. <laughs> Definitely our best loss. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was I was really pleased. I know Italy were under strength, but having said that, this that's still a strong team. I mean, there's real quality in the, in the, in the backup players they've got. They played in a similar manner and pushed on. And we, and we will take some key players out as well. But the fact of the matter is, we were the only team in the group stage that kept them at arm's length, and they put us under a lot of pressure. I've never felt we were in a cave in. Whereas those first two Italian matches, the pattern was loads of possession and pressure. Eventually, they the first goal, then they completely run riot, scores a 3 0, and then take the foot off the gas. With us, they got the first goal, but they never got to any of that stuff after that. No, um, I think we, you know, we, we changed the system. Mm. We knew we go through if we don't concede a bucket load. Yeah. It's essentially it, which is fine by me in terms of its qualification. If we don't qualify out this group, we'll remember that. If we qualify out the group, we will not remember that. Mm. So, in terms of the system we made, it was a you know decent goal. They uh, they got themselves ahead of. Like I say, they didn't push massively. They didn't try the luck. I was that's fine by me. I wasn't particularly nervous for it. I was when Switzerland, I think, went two up. Yeah, yeah. That's when I started thinking. Right, if we can see one more and they score one more, which is absolutely doable. It wasn't a case of we need to concede two more. Yeah. You know. That, that's when I started to think, oh, maybe. But then when Turkey pulled one back, I did think to myself, okay, I'm, I'm 
fairly confident yeah, at this late yeah. stage. Um, but it's exciting. Yeah. I mean, it's it's almost underwhelming in a way when you think about your when you think about 2016 and when we got through. This party's in the streets now. It's like, yeah, we're through. Standard. <laughs> we've we've come to the point where we expect to qualify for things, and that's so odd. So it's like, yeah. But no, I thought I thought we we played well so far. Um, we've we've managed our games well. Rob Page, fair play to him for 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 the situation he came into, and picking that team up. And yeah, I think he's been great. And there's been some really good team and individual performances out there so far in this tournament and I think quarterfinals are absolutely a realistic target now. Yeah, absolutely. Denmark are an interesting side to come up against. Mm. And our good side and of course are everyone's favourite second team. That was Ellis James put a really good tweet out this week about how hang on, did Everyone wants Wales to lose now. <laughs> yeah. We were like everyone's yeah. sort of, yeah. once Iceland went out in 2016, yeah. everyone was backing Wales. Yeah. And to a degree, a lot of people still like, you know, yeah. like to yeah. back Wales in terms of, you know, the, the relationship they've got with the fans and stuff like that. But all of a sudden, we're the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> Understandably, but yeah, it's great. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be an odd sensation, that one, where the world doesn't want us to win the game. <laughs> exactly. We'll go back to the photo back, no doubt. Yeah, I'd hope um, so. And just have to watch out, I think, for the fact that in that first match, the Swiss setup, which a lot of teams have gone for, just doing of the Swiss strikers with the attacking midfielder in the middle, causes a bit of problems that led to overloads on the flanks. Our back four has to play narrow. And the Danes play like that, where you've got two strikers that I like, but they don't score goals. And mm. they, but their movement and their work rate is terrific, and we've got to be careful that Martin's to rush over the first goal doesn't happen to us for a dance car to give them space on the edge of the area to do what he feels like. Although it must be said, I don't think the Welsh team, even in their worst nightmares, could play like Russia plays with the most abject cowardice and uselessness that you could imagine. Sorry, Vladimir, if you're watching. It's, it's an odd one in terms of that Russian team. I don't get them because they generally Russia. I mean, touching on Russian sports, there's some controversy there. Yes. But, there <laughs> however, I don't expect the Russian team to play with any fear. Generally, like that's just as as a nation. Generally, they won't. But they were just abject failures five years ago, and they have been again. And it's. It, that, that was always an odd one. Best game I've ever watched Wales was the win over Russia, That's three 0 win. Yeah, yeah. That that was my absolute. I yeah. I was you know, it, that was just football heaven that game for me. Yeah, that was yeah. my standout yeah. moment at that tournament. But Russia, yeah, I, I'm still surprised by it that, that they aren't progressing late on and and causing teams trouble. So it's just. I just feel like. I, how the hell did they get to the semi-finals of the World Cup or however far they got? Yeah. Um, how the heck did that happen? I look at the Russian team and, and, and it feels like, to me, the stereotypical Russian team. You've got a keeper with a mistake in him. Mm. You've got a slow defence who like kicking people. You've got a midfield who are just hard workers. Mm. Um, you've got a couple of nice fluffy, muffy, harmless, creative players behind your big sort of... Um, Refrigerating units of a striker that if you hit the ball hard off him, it'll bounce off a of funny angle. Yeah. Uh, you know, the rugby ball of football. It's a stuff will bounce where you don't expect it to go. Uh, I'd love to feel as well, Russia. We don't pound it up. <laughs> yeah, I like how we can also say that because we don't have them. So, yeah, we would have absolutely battered them. 6 0. Uh, yeah. I still think we would have Denmark is. Finland would have given us a much tougher game than Russia, I think. Because they have dug in made it hard for us to play. Would Finland have given us a tough game than Denmark? No. No. Because Denmark is good. Denmark's the worst one we could have had there, isn't it? In terms of quality, definitely. But, I, I have but it's still winnable. Sneaking feeling for us in that game. I right. think it's 50-50. Yeah. And I saw someone describe it as that yesterday and it, the bang on, I think. Um, I think it's going to be, again, system and personnel is going to be really important. So obviously we started with Williams at left wing back, didn't we? Oh, Italy. Yeah, yeah. So if we go back to a four, you yeah. would expect that he drops out again. Yeah. So it's it, it. I'd like to see a start, Morel. Yes. I've really liked Morel. Yeah. 
I mean, for a player who played about 25 games for Luton last season to be doing what he does at the Euros, I, he's really impressed me. I have to admit, I've not seen too much of him um, before now, but I've just really been impressed. Ramsey's been our best player this tournament yeah. by a mile. Bale has been either unbelievable or disappointing, should we say? Not, not. I don't know. I mean, the miss against Italy wasn't great, was it? Yeah, but I think people have built that up more than it was. I mean, it's for a player of his quality, it's a real, it's a real chance. But it's not. What was the XG on it? Come on, I don't know. I, I do not care for XG. I think a player national like fact and an any any player national league and above buries that chance. And he plays for Real Madrid. You've been watching Wrexham for all these years, and you think that any player national league and above buries it? Ah, right, there's a few names. I mean, I think he doesn't play for Real Madrid, does he? Well, it sort of does. He will next year. He got on well, Ancelotti. What do you reckon next year? Real Madrid first leg. I don't care. Oh. <laughs> Is Hamas Rodriguez going back? Hamas Rodriguez. Um, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Too shame. Yeah, he will go back and play, I don't think. I, but do you not think so? Ancelotti likes him. Yeah, true. Okay, fair enough then. Because he yeah. took him to Real Madrid originally. Yeah. Ancelotti, and then he took him to Everton. And so the likelihood is that oh, he's yeah. probably, whilst packing up his office, also put him in his suitcase as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you could expect him to go there. So um, that would be interesting. I still think he's mad, like, it's mad that there's no Real Madrid players in that Spain team. That's, that's, I mean, that's the first time ever, isn't it, surely? So, yeah. The, um, well, in that case, let's move on to the rest of the tournament. Oh, well, yeah. I'd say Spain suddenly battered Slovakia, but I find it I've got to be honest. I, I, I lose in the and I don't know. I think he's very stubborn, and he's just mm. like refusing to do things that are obvious to fix the problem. And, all right, in the end, they haven't done. But I think Slovakia collapsed a bit, and the comedy on goal, and, and everything like that. I, I, I just, yeah. There's not the drive in the Spanish team to go forward. So I, they've I, got in, but that's 16 or Croatia, I think. Yeah, I, I often think teams who do sort of the double. So when they won the World Cup and the Euros, often go, this is amazing, and then just sort of fall apart. As expected, yeah. almost. Um, I expected, I mean, France could have won the last Euros, couldn't they? Really, and should have done. So I, I would consider that France team in that bracket. And then, you know, Germany were, were absolutely sensational um, for the World Cup. So. Yeah, it, Spain have, have had that thing where they've drifted off. They they have patches where they're unbelievable and then they're pretty bad. Maybe at the minute it's their sort of eh, phase. They're, they're tight, they've got lots of beautiful, tidy, technical players, but they don't hurt you like champion. No. They're young, aren't they? Yeah, and I think they're great. But, yeah. but what I don't understand, Enrique, is he also plays with thrust, who can break through the lines and he doesn't use them. I mean, why have I'm, I'm Rodri's a very good player? Yeah. Um, I, but when in the first game they just passed the ball square in front of Sweden's defence, clearly you start using Thiago yeah. because he can play past the split defence. And, and so in the second match he starts Rodri and doesn't even bring Thiago off the bench mm. and they don't win. And I think they've got play. Uh, Moreno should have started from the first game because Moreno gives a bit extra dropping off and playing penetrative passes. Yeah. Um, you know you can't leave everything to Pedri. He was trying to scoop balls over the top. He, Sometimes yeah. Like, and he's a lovely girl. I'm like, ah, that's, I mean, he's not even, what, 19, is he? Yeah, yeah he's, he's, I think they're looking at him as going, I think you might be oh, yeah, young yeah, enough and fearless yeah, enough to, yeah, to do this for us. Yeah, and yeah it's, it's there's a, too many players a bit like that, neat and cute, and you need someone to be making runs for them. You know, that, that tiki-taka Spain team still had Torres and Villa, who would be making runs from funny angles and mm. dragging people around and getting them to the sharp ends. Barat is, oh, I mean, Barat is quite fragile, isn't he? Really? Yeah. Now he, he sums up what you say about sometimes he's on, sometimes he's off. That mm. was again. Um, I'm interested in getting your take on this. So obviously that tiki taka type yeah. football that perhaps Guardiola's Barcelona made famous. Do you think it's dying out? Definitely. I think it is. I think the press is now the, becoming the thing, isn't it? And that's now the style that Klopp's implemented. And give it five years, the press will be unpopular and it'll be something new. But it does feel like it's, it. it yeah, it, it just it feels like it's dying out, doesn't it? At this point. I mean, tiki taka. Firstly, is, is an insulting term. 
Mm. That, but, uh, but people used that at first against our Barcelona team because they thought they weren't exciting. Yeah. And Guardiola doesn't like it. No. Um, and really, I would argue that it was only really Barcelona who ever played it because it was that perfect storm of all these amazing technical players who you couldn't get the ball off. I think Man City have implemented it pretty well under him, though. But I, yeah, but, but and it's done. It's an adaptation of it. It's not, it's not the same. I would argue. Yeah, but you've got to adapt, haven't you? It's adapt yeah, design, yeah, isn't yeah, it? And yeah, yeah. I think Man City have got the players that have done that really well. I mean, in terms of when you look at who they've got and the players that they brought in at the back, uh, in particular, so that they can get the ball rolling. No pun intended. I, I just think they've adapted it well. I think they're the last great team to be doing it and they may well be the last great team to do it in this sort of era and Liverpool's system worked but they lost key players and then all of a sudden collapsed a bit and this Man City team they've got players who they can rotate and bring in to play that sort of style I realise this is nothing to do with the Euros but it's it's yeah it is and because for me City are the best team in the country and I still think they're miles ahead of Liverpool. It's going to be interesting to see how they how they continue to adapt, particularly when Guardiola goes. Because yes. teams lose their entire identity when Guardiola leaves. So let's say he's off in two years or something. He's just signed a contract, hasn't he? I believe. Well, I don't know how long it was. Two, well, maybe about three years or whatever it was. But when he goes it will be very, very interesting to see what style they begin to adopt. I imagine they'll try and go for someone similar and keep that sort of DNA, but where football will be in that time, I don't know. But um, I think we've seen a lot more tradition of the big strikers coming back as well. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was playing with semantics a bit when I was saying about well, not playing tiki-taka. I just mean the pure sort of tiki-taka. Total football, yeah. Uh, well, no, 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 I, I see that as different. But, yes, yeah. But like, you know, Barcelona would like be, you look back on the stats regularly getting over 80% possession, mm. that's just crazy, that was that suffocation. You can't score past us because you, you never have the ball, that, that's yeah. the rush. And I don't think, I think that when he went to Bayern, he had to adapt to something a little more direct. I know yes. You know, adaptation again with City, it's still possession based. But yeah, you're quite right, football is all about something that becomes fashionable, then other people find ways to counteract it. Mm. Other people find ways to counteract that. Yeah. And then you look at Klopp's local, for example, who were very aggressively direct and aggressive in their pressing, but actually when it came to the season where they actually make the breakthrough, they become more possession based as well. And they're mm. like a hybrid of the Klopp style and the Guardiola style, really, aren't they? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Because they can keep possession brilliantly, but they can also pressure. They don't, they don't press as much as they used to in the same way. Mm. They used to have that ferocious yeah. pressure. You know, Bielsa, very set style of play. But Leeds don't play like Athletic Bilbao play. Yeah. It's, it's refinements as, as it yeah. goes on, isn't it? You know? and, yeah, I was so, so. The first time I became so tactically interested in a particular matchup rather than just going, oh yeah, City play Liverpool great, was when those two met in around 2018 ish and Klopp's style had been cemented. Yeah. And obviously Guardiola's side was, was demented. Uh, was demented. Demented, well, demented the, the demented, demented Spaniard. Spaniard. <laughs> <laughs> Guardiola. No, uh, was uh, implemented as well. And it's it's so interesting that it's essentially that was City's kryptonite. Mm. Yeah. Because the only team who could beat City at that time really was Liverpool, and it was down to the system. They were used to having the ball, teams sitting back, dropping back as well, being able to pass through. All of a sudden, they had a team in their face, and you get in someone's face enough, you win that ball back. And you know your possession's going down. You aren't able to to put together those patterns to play. And all of a sudden, Liverpool were beating them. They weren't winning the league because City were losing to Liverpool, but they weren't losing to anyone else. Palace maybe once. Do you know what I mean? So that Liverpool team, I think, had to adapt, and they did, and they went on to win the league. And then they collapsed a little bit last season. I don't buy the injuries thing. Personally, and I know you're you're fond of Liverpool, but I, I don't buy it personally, and I don't buy the didn't buy a defence. Fond, but not a fan. Um, it's a historical thing, folks. And I mean, to be, I think the injury is definitely a part of it because I mean, it just no centre backs for a good chunk of the season. Nat Phillips did very well, but 
Mm. My thing with that's always been, are Liverpool a one-man team with Van Dijk or are they the best team that the Premier League's ever seen? Because they're the two claims I see. The claim I see is, oh, this is the best Liverpool team, this is the best Premier League team. OK, if it's the best Premier League team, then injuries won't be a problem for you. Or you've lost Van Dijk and now all of a sudden you can't win the league, so are you a one-man team? I mean, they didn't replace Lovren, and I think with hindsight, they'd have to admit that was a mistake. I know that you know, Lovren had his detractors as well, uh, yeah. but he was a good, solid Premier League centre-back as well. Yes. And, you know, people, oh, good, we can upgrade from where well, they didn't really. Matic is traditionally injury-prone, and, you know, I think if, if, not, if he hadn't been, and Gomez hadn't got injured, I think Gomez and Matic at the back would have carried them through a lot better. So I think you know, you'd empty with Miss Van Dijk because he is the best centre back in the world. But, mm. but I haven't said that. I think they had they had enough backup, but they know got injuries and they shouldn't have sold that full centre back, I don't think. And once you start disrupting your pattern of play by having Fino at the back, and he's crucial to either play, or Henderson having to play at the back, mm. you're affecting other departments of the team. And yeah. It's one of those things where it stops clicking. So I think it was a major and the other part is that I think that the COVID season affected team stamina, obviously, yes. that's the whole debate about how many substitutions you're allowed to have. Mm-hmm. And Liverpool's pressing game, of course, is stamina based. And if you don't get your pressing quite right, I mean, ticky tack is safe football, isn't it, really? Yes. Yeah, keep the ball, yeah. you can't be hurt. If you're, if you're in trouble, play it backwards, just keep mm. the ball. Um, that high pressing style of play is high risk football, isn't it? Like you say, that. It works beautifully when it works, so Liverpool getting in City's face, stopping them from passing out the back, mm. winning the ball, and, and, and taking all the transition really quickly, it's fantastic. But it's high risk, because you push the really high behind it, mm. and you, you, you're over-committing deliberately, and if it doesn't work, and it breaks down, because you're not quite pressing right, because maybe players are a bit tired, or players are not in slightly familiar positions, or they don't normally have recognised the triggers that, that affect that part of the pitch, it can go wrong very quickly. And a classic example of that Aston Villa battering they took. Yes. Where yeah. I don't think if I know City did take a pound in from the neighbors, I can't remember. But generally I think a team like City will correct themselves and at least keep control of the game even if it lost it. Mm. Whereas a, a local team playing in that style and chasing games to behind just to keep pushing on, pushing on. And I think that sort of team is always open mm. to that sort of pounding. Yes. If it doesn't if it's not quite clicking they're open yeah. to, to get to get to a beating like that. And it just happens often. I think to be honest, do you reckon they win the league next year? I think quite. I think possibly if Van Dijk's back from the start, one man team. I think quite possibly. Are they a one man team? No. Are, Are they the best team in the Premier League of all time? For that one season, yeah. I think that they were of a similar standard to City at their best. <laughs> No, surely not. That 100 point season. That one hundred. Yeah, they were they were nice to watch, but they just. They scored goals on the sides, couldn't gather arms. They were they were team that one year, but they haven't sustained it again, and they haven't sustained it. Say the local team in the early 80s or Ferguson's team. Yeah, well, I mean, well, I mean, well, back them against them. If I'm honest, both those teams. I. I I yeah I would I wouldn't place them above United's team in 07 08 nor would I the trouble winning season of United or Arsenal's invincibles or Chelsea's 2004 5 team I wouldn't place them above City Centurion team either the Arsenal invincibles drew a hell of a lot of games they only just won the league you know they actually lost one game that season huh they lost oh, to Portsmouth they, Portsmouth they lost to Portsmouth they lost mate because Portsmouth Robert Pires dived at Highbury, Glen at Glen, you don't you say, oh, I, don't I, you I say the Lord's name in vain. Uh, uh, <laughs> Glen, can, Glen, so, so they drew, but you're not we drew, one of the goals counted? Yeah, basically. Uh, well, uh, Arsenal failed to beat two teams that season, Man United and Portsmouth, but we drew at Highbury one all, and Robert Pires dived for the penalty, that equalised. Only two teams scored two goals at Old Trafford in the 2000 and and the 1995-6 season, Nottingham Forest, Stan Collingwood scored them both, and Wrexham. Oh really? 5-2? Yeah. Wow, that's a great fact. Because we're the best. That's great. Yeah. I don't think you scored our goals, it would have been... Durkin. Durkin oh, sc- did Durkin score both? No. No, uh, first one, wasn't it? Big deflection outside the box. Ah, was it? Yeah, because yeah, Durkin put his head, didn't he? 
Yes, yeah. that was pretty, oh like my that. god, that was beautiful, in the away end. Were you in the away end, thought? Oh yeah. yeah, it was just amazing. And I, 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 I was particularly happy because of Michael was pioneering the whole handball goalie starfish thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was, I'd rant every time that I saw on TV, I'd rant about, why don't people just put it under him? Because that's the area he's not covered. He's covering the corners, the traditional places to aim for now. Yeah. He's standing up because he's doing that. You can't think, can you? Well, you can, but you have to be brilliant. It's hard to hit the corners. He's covering them. Mm. Roll it, just, just roll it straight at him underneath him because his feet are out there. He can't move, he can't adjust. And I used to go mad that no one ever did it. And then when someone finally did it, first time I ever saw someone do that, it was a Wrexham player. It's Kieran Durkin. Kieran Durkin's the one guy smart enough to see that glaring fault <laughs> in what, what Schmeichel's doing. And it's beautiful just to go one on one. Schmeichel goes, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. League one keeper, are you? Well, uh, striker, are you? Yeah. You're scared. And Durkin just rolls it under him. We third tier at that time, were we? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course we were, because we've been promoted two years before. Four, about three, four? Well, if it was 90... 1993, I was guessing what year it was. We got promoted in 1993, yeah. ah, didn't we? And then, I think... Yeah, that, was, that was 90... Oh, I think that would have been 90... Well, it might have been 95, 96. It was late 95, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Tony Hume's suspended, mm. but then they managed to get into play by claiming that a game against, I think it was Brumbo on the Friday night was a first team match. Do you know, right? I've <laughs> said this, I've said this about something the other day, I was like, right, if anyone does get suspended on the last game of the season, we need to set up three official FAW matches, call it a cup competition, right? You know, the suspension extraordinaire trophy, and just play them, and it'll be fine. Oh, the devious club you support, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we are in no positions of authority, luckily. <laughs> well, that was the best conversation about Euro 2020 I've ever had. <laughs> um, um, Italy going to win it, by the way. Uh, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. Who's going to win it? Who's going to win it? I think you reckon it's going to be Germany because of their route. Because you think they'll be able to beat the Netherlands and they've only got Sweden in the round of 16? Germany have got England. In the oh, of course 16. they have. Who am I thinking of? Who've got Sweden? Uh, Netherlands, maybe. Uh, Oh, I'm not. Ukraine, that's Sweden. Yeah, Ukraine, I think Ukraine will win it. I think Shevchenko, Yamalenko Alliance. I, was, I felt old, and I, I've started getting this thing where I see players I really enjoyed watching as a kid now become managers. So the likes of Lampard, Gerard, etc., um, they're all becoming managers. So I'm getting to that point now where I'm going, oh, I used to watch you when you were young, and now I'm sort of getting to my adult. And Shevchenko, I got a really horrible feeling about. <laughs> I once bought a AC Milan shirt with Shevchenko on the back whilst on holiday in Gran Canaria in 2006. And I got home to the hotel to find a time for Chelsea. <laughs> My favourite version of that tale mm. is oh, gosh. The shock transfer of Andy Cole from Newcastle to Man United, which absolutely nobody saw coming, obviously. Uh, I know what United you're going to say, there. yeah. The guy with the tattoo, the tattoo yeah. on his leg, on his calf. It's so Andy detailed, Cole. it's yeah, so yeah, big, yeah. it's so unnecessary. <laughs> but it's beautiful, <laughs> absolutely beautiful, yeah. There's a title, Andy Cole Tattoo. <laughs> That's a possibility. <laughs> I hope I can find a picture. If I can find a picture of that on Google, I think that's our episode name. Oh, the tattoo? Do you reckon? Oh, yeah, it's, it's on Google. Yeah, it's, I've it's seen that it. or red button chin cam, which I like. I personally like red button chin cam. Yeah, yeah that's, I think that's a good one. It, it? Yeah, it has, yeah. That's probably what I'll go for. Who do I think will win? Alright, Sweden play Ukraine. Sweden win. Which means Germany will play Sweden. Which means England will play Sweden. <laughs> England win. Do you genuinely think England are going to beat Germany? Yeah. Why? Because Germany aren't Germany, are they, anymore? Mm. They we're, not in, we're not in Munich anymore, Toto. There's a title. We're not in Munich anymore. Mind you, that could be misinterpreted. Um, I'll have to put Toto, not Pucci. They're from Cartoon Dog, who, to be honest with you, with all, all Pucci could be taken to <laughs> Nice. So, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Beer hole pooch. Can you mention something about dogs in a beer hole so I can spell it differently? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, so, uh, Germany, uh, Germany are... Germany have, have, were great against Portugal. Mm, that's my but, thinking. But when blunt against France and 
they had to come back from behind twice to beat Hungary at home. Yeah. I don't feel that scared of Germany. I think England will beat them. I think um, Germany have shown that they've got the quality by that Portugal game. I think Southgate is scared and he will play defensive. They've won, I think England's last few games have all been either 0-0 or 1-0 and they've scraped results against Romania, do teams like that. Don't matter, not against Germany. Mm. I don't think um, they will. That is the only game in the last 16 and the quarter-final where a team will have home advantage. Only England can have home advantage from now on for the 70s and the final play at Wembley. Mm. Last time Everyone England played Germany in the Euros at Wembley, they also didn't take that advantage, did they? True, true. Um, and I can't wait till they're knocked out so I don't have to hear about Euro 96 anymore. That's a fair point. That is a extremely fair point. Then it's Denmark against Wales. I'm too scared to predict that. I think um, Wales just... Czech Republic. Why did we go back to calling them the Czech Republic? Because they're Czechian now. Why are we all calling them the Czech Republic in football, but not in the real world? I know. Um, really. yeah. yeah. Good point. I don't know. It's Pavel Nepper playing anyway. Well, he's signed for Esfotini. Um, he they've been in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands going through. Mm. So then Netherlands against Wales in the quarterfinals. I I that's it. I really want. I really want to get through. Just I'd love to see us play. A team like the Netherlands. Seeing us play Portugal in a semi was amazing. And obviously playing Belgium in the quarters was great. But Belgium, as amazing as Belgium are, you don't think of Belgium when you think of great teams. You think of the Netherlands because of total football and Cruyff and, and all that. You think of Germany because of everything they've done in Brazil. And the Netherlands, I think, are one of those teams. Netherlands. It would be amazing. So should that be correct, Netherlands will beat us certainly. Uh, yeah, where will it be held? It will be held in the, some football ground. There's not venues on this. It's quite, Europe. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite a poor... You've got, you've got a poor, poor man's Euros poor man's wall man's chart. chart. <laughs> yeah. um, and then England play Sweden, so England win. Yeah. Or Germany play Sweden and Germany win. Yeah. And we're covering all bases. So then if it's Germany against Netherlands, <sighs> Netherlands win. That's going to be a slight bloodbath, isn't it? And if it's England against Netherlands, that won't. Well. I think England beat Netherlands, yeah. Do you think Germany beat Netherlands or Netherlands beat Germany? I think Germany beat Netherlands. Right, so in my reality, England gets to the final. What? And in your reality, Germany gets to the final. Mm. Okay, other side, France, Switzerland. France. Correct. Right. Croatia, Spain. That's so that's so close to call, but I think maybe maybe Croatia. Spain on pens. <laughs> Belgium, Portugal. Oh, it's a clock. That's horrible. If Fernando Santos goes back to type and plays the two static, complete lumps of all the midfielders they lose to Belgium. If he does what they did against France and has Renato Sanchez running around and beating you, why is he not picking to you? Passing, they go, they win. That's my theory. My, gut, the army. my gut says Portugal. Yeah. I, I just think, you know I think Ronaldo good. drags them through. Yeah. And Italy, Austria. Austria? Austria. Austria. Yeah. No. Italy. Back in the penalty shootout. Just like a game said. Oh yeah, who I I, I, do, I love I love the idea that that game goes to penalties. Dan Backman pulls out a sheet of paper. It doesn't say which direction they're going. It just says remember Gates hit a wee. And that's <laughs> <laughs> it's a trophy game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Remember, remember, remember Malcolm comes out. Oh, remember Gates hit a wee. Just remember, remember, remember Gates hit a wee, and a picture of Sarah um, Malcolm. <laughs> And I think we are sorted. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Griffith, the king of thumbnails. I just love it. Just Dan Backman going, oh, which way did John Stead go? Yeah, or whoever was playing for uh, the gate the fifth penalty for Austria. The, um... <laughs> Neil Ashton and steps Alan, up. Alan Steffi channels the spirit of Louis Moltz. Did he score the winner? So. Ashton would have taken first, wouldn't he? The big part of why I remember that is because I was... Just a bit annoyed that when I got the footage off them, their cameraman went back and saved the penalty 
that meant that if Mulder scored he won, switch the camera off around him. And did not film the winning penalty. Didn't he? No. And that really annoys me. The number of times I thought, that'd be a great one to put on YouTube, like an old classic old match. But there's no winning penalty. There's not someone putting their captions in. And then they were both scored. It was a nice penalty, and we won. And everyone celebrated in a lovely scene on the pitch, but you can't see any of them because of some pension and joy! Pension has another title! <laughs> Pension and Johnny! Oh, we've got so many great titles! Pension and Johnny! Yes! <laughs> oh, Vida Pen Pets! Now, how Vida Zane Pets? Because Austrian and Japan says perfect collaboration with the penalty shooter. Gostria. Gostria. Well, yeah. yeah. Or. Oh, Audi. <laughs> <laughs> I used to spot Metro over here. <laughs> Um, well, if, I, 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 I would like to touch yeah. just on the fact that Gateshead are a very nice club normally. They are, actually, yeah, yes, they're they very, are. very I, nice club. The best officer ta told me that he was straight with me and wasn't very pleased. So, yeah. you know, to be fair to Gateshead, I like Gateshead as well. Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. yeah. And the game was Gary Mills, so what else could we ask? So, in the quarterfinals, uh, uh, Italy win. Sorry, I disagree with you on that. No, I didn't win. think that until I went through the whole. Millican scenario. Millican scenario. Maybe that's more of a name for an 80s band. You'd have like sort of like sort of hair shapes like Wrexham Waterworld. <laughs> <laughs> and that very cool face bit of blusher. And yeah. sing songs about getting lost in Minsk. Oh, <laughs> well, no. You know those electric guitars, the double. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. The double keyboards, possibly. Oh, 100 percent yeah. Definitely gold army outfits. Yeah. And it's like have songs like um, I'm in love with a Latvian postman. Yes, That's absolutely. Sort of yeah, 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 yeah. As we all have been at exactly. some point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Relatable, <laughs> relatable material. Yes, and romantically, he's quite rigorous. It is rigorous into that bit. Yeah. I thought my knowledge of the Baltic states was off a bit then, but it isn't. Italians, if I follow this stuff. Um. So in the quarterfinals. You've got Croatia, in your strange mind, Croatia against France. Oh, that's that. Oh, that's tasty, isn't it? No, it's just hammering France as a baton. France has been slamming the mini cab door on it. Yeah, but there's a narrative there, isn't there? There's a narrative. Old men by young men. No, I just think it's a narrative of Croatia wanting revenge, and I think they wouldn't hold back. Yes, it could well be a drubbing, but I think, you know, I, I just think that'd be a really tasty game. Lions beating donkeys. Yeah. France win that? Yeah, France win that. Yeah, he's, he's, he's working for, for the BBC and you know, just builds up that nothing game or something like that. Game of Thrones battle scene. Hey, I'll, then, no, if you could just chuck in the, the Gascoigne goal in the middle of this now, then we'll, we'll truly be the BBC. Absolutely, yeah. Also, yeah. please don't, I don't want us to get a copyright strike. And then, <laughs> and then it's coming home, it's going to be Portugal against Italy. Mm. It's coming home, Calcio's coming home. Portugal, Italy. Oh, I think Italy going to win it, so yeah, Italy. Yeah, Portugal, definitely. <laughs> and I said it would be Spain against France, and then Spain on penalties for three. Bang! France. So you're saying semi-final France gets Italy, so you're saying Italy win. Because you're crazy. Yeah, why not? And then you're saying Italy-Germany final, and I would actually agree Italy would win then. I think Italy would win then. Uh, Barella scores and then invokes the spirits of the 1982 World Cup final by running up that way, Yeah. Did you, I was going to say, did you see that? That celebration was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. And then the other side, you reckon it's going to be Port, yeah, Portugal? No, no, no. Yeah, you've done that. Yeah, he's going to win. Yeah. And then I reckon it's going to be Spain in the semi final against Portugal and Portugal win. Because Portugal. Um, we talk Benito, and that our brave by that point Fernando Santos was giving up that team pick their own side and just giving up the <laughs> No, just do what Ronaldo did at the, the last final. Just basically take over the manager's job when he went off injured, which I loved. I still think Ronaldo should have both a medal for being a player and manager, because essentially he got them through that game, which is brilliant. <laughs> and, then, and then my final would be Portugal England, and there was only one possible way that could end at Wembley. Which is Portugal winning on penalties. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or Portugal um, getting some jammy sort of fluke goal 
off the back of Pepe's backside <laughs> and then just digging in for the entire 90 minutes mm. while the England fans slowly self-destruct yeah. and it creates a whole new legend about how they, they were the best team in the whole tournament but couldn't break them down. Yeah, Sol Campbell comes on late, scores from a corner but it's ruled offside. <laughs> and he just slides onto the car park. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's one of my favourite gifts in the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, so I think we've sorted everything out there in the whole world wide world. Should we just, I mean. Should we just stop? What? <laughs> the <laughs> world? <laughs> oh, I saw that happen once, but they're scary. <laughs> in the Pantheon in Paris, uh, there's a Foucault's pendulum. I'm very careful. I'm saying all these things like that. Foucault's pendulum. Mm. So you, you have to have a very high roof. You hang a really long chain down, put a weight at the end, mm. and basically it, it'll keep going in a circle, and it's not moving. It's, it's illustrating the rotation of the earth, so that the, the long chain with the ball at the end has the illusion that it's moving in a circle, but actually the earth is moving beneath it with us on it, mm. so it's proving that the earth is rotating. And in the Pantheon, it's a huge building, they hang it off the couple of the way inside of the couple of down, so they, they're about right there. Because obviously, Pantheon's you know, honouring the great French and people, Foucault's French, you know. And so, um, I had some of that there now, when he was about 10, and I was explaining to him, and I said, That can never stop moving. Because it's not actually moving, it's the earth that's moving. If, if that looks like it's not moving, we're all dead. Because <laughs> if the earth starts moving, we're finished. You know? mm. And we stood and looked at it, and, and I, I just thought, Man, I've I brought this young young mind the the wonders of science, the beauty of, of human thought, and the, the miracle of the universe. And he stood there with his eyes open, full of hope and awe. And I stopped moving. <laughs> and I thought, he looked at me and say, We don't do that. <laughs> I thought, I was trying to look reassuring, but I was expecting to feel myself sort of start to float as gravity but that's not working. Do you imagine um, the timing of that is when you're so, there yeah, looking exactly. at it? Typical yeah, yes. yeah. Um, well, well yeah. I, also I want to refund got, the yeah, world's exactly. ending. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before we, we resort, we do so, it'll be six to eight weeks. <laughs> um, barring apocalypse. Or a ghost, or apocalypse. Yeah. 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 Everything is melted except the icy. <laughs> snacks. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so basically, it was okay because a bloke dressed in the style of Morgan and Wise at the end, Eric Morgan, with a Mac and a flat cap on, walked up and pushed it with a broom, <laughs> and I just started moving again. And I was just like, <laughs> crisis over. <laughs> he never really slept properly again, and he slept fitfully, you know, 13 years later. I wasn't expecting that outcome. I was expecting to go, his eyes looked full of hope as he asked me, can we go and get an ice cream? But <laughs> no, that's the apocalypse. That's the apocalypse, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, it doesn't matter because we are, in fact, all a computer simulation. That's right. We're more likely to be a computer simulation, aren't we, for every single piece of technology that we create. Yeah. Well, let's end this now. <laughs> Um, I, we're back after the clumsy edits because I said oh, something Ollie didn't like. <laughs> he thought it was in bad taste. Oh, your camera appears so frozen as well. Oh, oh you've got such a grumpy look on your face. <laughs> oh boy, this is I, am, I am. I am in fact really pleased yeah. and happy with life. So you don't look at it. Don't. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll leave now, and Dragon Heart will return next week, just ready for that Austria England final. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show, Ollie. You're a legend. No, I've loved it, mate. It's been brilliant to get back on. Absolutely. Excellent. And we'll see you next week, muchachos. Thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe as well so you don't miss out on any of our content and click the bell to get notifications.